So we are going to be talking about the intersection of media, sports, and entertainment, and new technology. And what does that mean within the world of AI, VR, AR, NFTs, Web3, Metaverse? Where are we with creators, with content, with uh, intellectual property? So I have an amazing panel here who will talk with us today about all of those things. I'm going to let each of you introduce yourselves real quickly. I think people have the bios, but uh, let's just do that, and then we'll jump right into it. So, Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Natalia Ranovic. I'm an attorney. Legal disclaimer here. <laughs> That's not legal advice. Uh, I'm here to help you educate you all about intellectual property, what is, it, what is intellectual property, and why you should care about, <laughs> especially right now in the Web 3.0 uh, when you use artificial intelligence. So my background, as I said, I'm an intellectual property attorney. I started, like, the boom of my career was in 1999 when people were trying to figure out the conflicts between domain names and internet, and that's happening again <laughs> in the Web 3.0. So I recently participated in a study from the um, USPTO that it was uh, the, the Congress uh, re requested the USPTO to conduct a study about the... Uh, what, what was the impact of NFTs and in intellectual property? So that's me. And thank you very much, Beverly, for <laughs> inviting me to be part of this panel. Yes, and thank you as well. My name is Ian Brown. Um, I'm CEO and co-founder of ACIB Management. And at ACIB, we focus on working with collegiate athletes and high school students who are now able to make money off of their name, image, and likeness. Um, and the way that I met Beverly was through a Twitter spaces where we were speaking about NFTs and crypto and at ACIB, we really focused on using crypto during the huge crypto boom about a year ago, um, to really take advantage of the money that was being made for our athletes. Um, at the end of the day, collegiate athletes have been taken advantage of, um, in a way that isn't often seen in a free market economy. Um, so we have tried our hardest to make them as much money as possible, and I'll get into more of that later. Awesome. Hi, everyone. I'm Shira Lazar. I'm the founder and CEO of What's Trending. We are the first digital publisher to cover the social media water cooler. Um, over a decade ago, I've been covering a digital culture before even YouTube was around, so I'm kind of aging myself. And then over the past year or so, got into the Web3 space. Who knows about Web3 here, what Web3 stands for? Okay, there's like 50% who don't. So for context, Web1 was like the beginning of the internet, right? Dot com, boom. Web2 was about social media um, and also you know, content creation. And then Web3 is about ownership and all the tech that's built on the blockchain. So when you hear about NFTs and the metaverse um, and crypto, we're talking about the Web3 world um, and the movement around the creator economy, at least for me, around that. Um, and so you know, that led me to consulting and advising in Web3, creating a lot of content, oh, making it more accessible for people. I'm an enthusiast, so I never say I'm an expert, but I'm bringing you along the journey with me. And also, uh, per a personal growth and mental health and wellness um, in digital culture is really important for me. And so, also started a company called Peace Inside Live, where we're a digital wellness agency bringing these tools to different spaces where we all are virtually or IRL. So amazing panel. I mean, this is a lot of this is a lot of brain power here. And so I just published a book called Imagine That from PCs to NFTs, where I really seek to educate and inform everybody about what is an NFT, what is blockchain, what is all of this. I have nine use cases in that book and, uh, and talk about all of these different topics. So what we really want to focus on today is how are these tools being used uh, in the sports and entertainment industries, or are they being used? Is that just a myth, or are we so early that it's just brand new? Is this just another flash in the pan and AI is going to take over everything anyway, so who cares? I mean, where are we, you know? Uh, we also want to talk about the impact of Web3 
uh, on the fan experience or the audience experience and how that's uh, working. And then also what are some new potential business models? So what I'd like to do is, uh, uh, Shira, why don't we start with you? You just came back from uh, NFT NYC. So uh, just so everybody knows, there's a lot of different conferences happening. There was one here in Los Angeles in March called Outer Edge, which was rebranded NFT LA. Uh, these are very well attended. Uh, and it really is about, you know, all the studios coming and talking about what their uh, efforts are or not. Uh, in these spaces, but tell us a little bit about from the media standpoint and entertainment standpoint, Shira, mm -hmm. what you're seeing specifically as it relates to creators and opportunities. Yeah, what I'm seeing is the use cases right now. We know Ticketmaster and Spotify have announced a lot of partnerships. Ticketmaster was playing around with an experiment with ticketing. We know ticketing is a huge issue. Uh, so NFTs create a certificate of authenticity where once it's created on the blockchain, um, you can't reverse that, right? And you know where it came from, the origin of it. So they were playing around with uh, Avenged Sevenfold was the band that said yes to this experiment. And it was a positive one, which is great. Um, and so I think for ticketing and music and concerts, it's gonna be huge for community building um, because you have more ownership of your audience and the contract. So you get to see, you know, uh, and be part, I think the, the community and the artist gets to be part of um, the money that is made in the transaction, which is a really cool thing. In the past with social media, it was pretty much the platform and the creator, not so sure about that. Um, but the um, smart contracts and what is being built in Web3 enables for, I think, everyone to win. Uh, so I see that as a huge use case that's working with fashion and luxury fashion um, in, at NFT NYC. Adidas was there um, and a lot of other fashion brands doing a big, like, big work. Uh, you know, a lot of fashion brands came together for Metaverse Fashion Week, even though not a lot of people were in the Metaverse. Still, it was interesting to see of the opportunity and uh, possibility. Uh, and then I also see franchises. I see, you know, f uh, fandoms really coming together because it's like the new baseball card, right? Or it's not like the comic book that you would buy, but art on the blockchain. And as you hold these, um, these digital assets, it gives you access to additional perks. Um, and so I think for people that are really loyal and fans of franchises, this could be huge. And I know Star Trek had one. Uh, I, I mean, there's so many other IP that have launched these NFTs that have sold out. So it's not just a buzzword. I think it's gotten a bad rap. I think there are certain use cases where this is definitely not going away. And we've seen that it's a positive thing, not a negative one, as long as, you know, it's not about trading and necessarily degens, but really targeting uh, those who really care um, and creating more of a connection with those folks and building community. That's fantastic. And um, let's talk a little bit about, uh, this was mentioned earlier in the panel, um, the intersection of sports and entertainment. You know, it's, it's not news that that's coming together. We're seeing more and more of uh, the intersection there. And so Ian, uh, first of all, I, want, I would love for you to, um, you know, detail and give the definition of what is NIL in the sports world and why is, did that make such a big impact? for the student athlete who is the creator of content and how your agency is helping uh, these student athletes monetize through NIL and NFTs and Web3 and their own crypto economies that are being created. There is some really big movement in this area. <coughs> A lot of people will say, <coughs> excuse me, well, uh, you know, they're going to ruin their opportunity for, you know, the NBA or whatever. No, they're making millions now. Okay, this is really changing the game. So let's hear about that. Absolutely. And I might have to go back to you for the rest of this question. But to start, NIL, most basically put, is name, image, and likeness. Um, a federal law was passed barring the NCAA from penalizing students from making money off their name, image, and likeness. For the longest, the NCAA has been the only player making money in the amateur athletics game. Um, and I would make the argument since around 1980 when college sports were really 
getting closer to full integration is when the sport really started making money and the NCAA has been taking all of that ever since. So what the NIL ruling has allowed is for athletes to get a small portion of the pie that they are creating. Um, there is a labor battle right now with collegiate athletes, the NCAA, and our business, ACIB, is here to help them fight that battle. Um, we're helping them try to actualize their worth, and these people are worth so much money. They're walking businesses these days, and um, to explain that the best, it's probably looking at the NIL numbers from last year. $1.9 billion was generated in NIL. Um, and in the student athlete, <laughs> in the student athlete universe, yeah. that's not NIL for big famous people. That's just the student athlete universe. It's huge. And you have a finance background, which I wanted to mention also. And so talk about that as a business, both for what you do and then also keep going about the students. For sure. For sure. Um, so during my time in college, I graduated from the college of the Holy cross in 2019. And during my time there, I focused on finance. I thought I was going to Wall Street. I thought I was going to take over the world from New York. Um, but what I didn't realize is I, I, I didn't really care for the work that much. I didn't want to sit in Excel and fly through spreadsheets. I, I really wanted to be able to help people. And that's how ACIB was created. My roommate, Andre Chevalier, and I created the company in 2019. And from there, we started working with the Sierra Canyon basketball program running basketball operations. And through that, we were able to see that these kids have huge economies th that they are able to run. Multiple players on the Sierra Canyon basketball team um, have over hundreds of thousands of followers on Instagram. They're bringing in well over six figures a year. Um, and these are high school students. And being able to see that allowed us to see how large of a market there is for NIL, for these creators, and for the economies that they're running. So that is fantastic, and we'll talk more about that. Uh, and Natalia, let's go back to basics real quick. A lot of people here do know what IP is. This is the entertainment uh, audience. But let's give the definition of intellectual property and what is in this new universe. What is intellectual property? What isn't intellectual property? Where does AI fit in? which is surprising, and how far behind are the policy makers from the technology that we're seeing? Could you just raise your hand if you know what intellectual property is? Okay, yeah, we have a good, <laughs> I think people understand, but it's some, so, but sometimes people think they understand and actually there's a lot of confusion right now in the web 3.0 and NFTs. So I'm just gonna be very basic and you can go to Beverly's book <laughs> after she explains that and I have a chapter where I talk about IP. So we have four types of IP. The first one is trademarks. It's the name of your product or service. We have copyrights that are original ideas protected in that something that I can hear, see, or touch. Books, videos, music, lyrics, scripts. And then you have patents, there are inventions. And finally, you have trade dress, that is what you know, that is unique of, of your business. Those are the four types. There are not any other type of IP besides those four. And what is important here? IP needs, you can have IP rights for something that was created by the human mind. Only humans, let's say a monkey is gonna take a po photograph and they use that example, and the photograph could be copyrighted, but it was taken by a monkey. A monkey is not a human, so you cannot get protection for the photograph. And first, why you need to care about Web 3 in the Web 3.0 about IP? Because everybody's talking about this new business model when you can monetize your own IP. Right now, you have ag uh, agents in the middle in the entertainment industry. You have a lot of middlemans. And in the, in the web 3.0, you're going to be able to own your data, your idea also, and sell that and make money with that. But a lot of things that people think they're IP and they are, they are being selling through as IP right now are not. Because one big discussion in IP world and legally has been the um, artificial intelligence. And anything that is created by artificial intelligence does not have IP rights because it's not created by the human mind. 
So that's a lot of those uh, NFTs that have been selling as digital art. The majority of them are use, use artificial intelligence and people are paying royalties. They are treating as they were IP when they are not. What's the consequence if something is not IP? You don't have the rights related to IP. That is the right, the exclusive right to distribute, reproduce, and sell and license and all those things. So that's is still so. I think regarding IP, the first thing that if you want to enter in this world, you need to understand exactly what you are creating, if have IP rights and what those are. So. And also you can take a look after this explanation. You can go to the USPTO website to learn more about it. They have a lot of information out there. So that's the... And this was actually a big thing, and I, I didn't actually touch on this with the Future Entertainment, because, you know, Board Ape Yacht Club, which was this, you know, the big um, apes that everyone was buying for way too much money. Um, and the whole, uh, the great thing about it is that you own the IP. So a lot of people were making money off businesses. Some people started a burger business, a cannabis business, and used their Board Ape as like the mascot, right? Because of the, uh, the popularity of it. So you were able to own that and make money from it or license it to a commercial or a brand. Someone licensed theirs to Target for t-shirts at a certain point. Who knows if people want that now, right? It was a time and place thing. So I think IP as it relates to what AI, and then Web3 IP, like NFTs, because, you know, uh, the IP of these popular characters, like if, if a world is popular, you want to uh, you wanna build that, right? Maybe it's a cartoon, maybe it's a movie, maybe it's a series. We're seeing a lot of that. We're seeing where every project is heading right now as, as we see where things land in a bear market. It seems like Board Ape is going more, and Yuga Labs, which owns it, is going more the gaming route. Right, um, and and that's where they're gonna head. Doodles um, hired Pharrell, I believe, as their like creative director. It seems like they're going more the IP route, the cool factor. Let's build the Doodle where you could see it everywhere, and and that's the value of it. Toy Burg to, uh, Toy Boogers is one, <laughs> and they did a deal with Time to develop a series. We haven't seen the results of that. But you could see if you have like an interesting character and world you've created, how that can translate in different ways as well. And I'll add one more thing because this is media and entertainment and a space we're talking about this. Tokenized media is a big thing. So NFT Now, which is one of the leading publishers, and even this other company, Rug Radio, they're finding new ways to monetize as a media publisher. Um, the media business and publishing business, as we know, is broken. I run a digital publisher. It's a miracle we're still alive, and I feel very proud of that. Uh, but we need to find a way to incentivize not just the companies and the advertisers, but the, the users, and make everyone feel like they're part of the growth and, and this brand winning. So what I love about this, and I think that there's more people are going to do this, is how do you maybe have some sort of uh, utility tokens right on the blockchain, where the more you engage, Right, if you were a consumer of this publisher, you gain tokens from reading something, from sharing it, right, from posting about it. So I'm incentivized, like I'm making money off of my activity. And then also on the other side, and this is all the activity is, um, you could see it on the blockchain. So there's no debating it. It's not like the back end, which you're like, well, is that really right? Is that really true? I'm getting a report from someone like, how transparent is this? You could see it all, all, all of the transactions, the activity on the blockchain. And then on the other side, you know, the publisher can gain from that. And maybe the writer also. So everyone is winning in that instance. And then if you buy an access pass, that's like the new subscription. The NFT, the digital asset, gives you access to events, additional content. So I think that we're seeing a lot of these new publisher media brands play around with this, like, and I would encourage you to check them out, Rug Radio and NFT Now. But this could be a model that I think is really interesting for other uh, media companies as well. Just before you go, oh, Ian, sorry. I want to congratulate you, Shira, for being uh, one of the 100 most influential by NFT Now. In they, it was just announced this week, and so that's fantastic. So go ahead, Ian. Yeah, no, I just wanted to follow up on the tokenization of uh, creators. Um, that's really where we got our start with NIL um, on, on, on a larger stage. We started working with Jalen Clark, um, UCLA basketball player here, and we created a creator token for him um, really on our end, what we wanted to see was 
how 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 much are these social media accounts and all of these followers worth really and the best way to find that out was creating the creating the token um and allowing Jalen's fans and people who wanted to support him um to buy this token and gain more access to Jalen so you would be able to buy the token um or if you buy a certain amount of tokens be able to get a game worn shoe or a signed jersey um, allowing people more access to Jalen allowed us to see really how much that Instagram, TikTok, YouTube is worth. Um, and I'm not going to speak to any numbers of, or anything like that, but the numbers are huge they for these athletes. They were very significant, okay, G like life-changing significant, uh, absolutely. And you're now working with the women's uh, UCLA women's basketball team, the whole team, which is unbelievable. So... How does this translate to actors, to writers, to creatives, other creatives? This translates, this idea of tokenizing content and access translates to everything. Uh, Shira mentioned it, everybody in the, in the value chain, right? The publisher, the writer, the consumer. It also translates to everybody in the value chain of the uh, athlete, everybody in the value chain of the musician or the singer or the rapper or the actor or the individual. My personal brand can be uh, a, an economy. Okay, and we heard about that with Black Love in our previous uh, presentation about uh, an economy building all around a particular, a one particular series now has a whole economy around it. This is what we mean by the ownership economy. It's a completely different way of looking at how we're going to monetize entertainment and creation. Go ahead. I'll just add, sorry, you keep on bringing things up, but I'm like, I'll just add, and I'll give credit someone, Swan Sit, who I adore, who talked about this in like a video on her Instagram, uh, because I thought it was such a great analogy of like, you're, uh, you're valuable because your wallet's gonna be valuable because everything is transparent. For a brand to know what you've already interacted with and bought, how valuable is that in terms of understanding what you love and what you care about and your value system, right? So that connection to your wallet, your wallet is gonna be, you know, is gonna be everything. Um, and so while that's accessible and everyone can see it, what do you do with that? Right, and so I think that it, it kind of brings back the power into the hands of the consumer, but then you know everyone has a wallet that will be valuable and to understand in order to market to and to connect with. And there are people who say your wallet will be like your email addr address is today, okay? It'll be what you use to interact with others. So I wanna come back and thank you both. I wanna come back to intellectual property and uh, some of the rights people have. Let's talk a little bit more about the AI uh, situation and also uh, anything you want to add to what everybody's speaking yeah. to now. Yeah, just going back, uh, what Shiria, right, said before, uh, in the web 1.0, uh, we, we are researching. We are using the internet for research. Web 2.0, 2 I was fortunate to have Beverly here as my branding <laughs> professor at UCLA, and he, she taught me about social media and the power to have a voice through social media. Uh, but what happened? In the web 2.0, the social media companies own our own, they own all our data. So we have several laws to protect privacy and everything else. Web 3.0 is a kind of response to all that. Because in the new web, we're gonna own our data. We're gonna own everything we put out there. And like we said, the wallets. And now the big thing is the conflict between domain names and uh, trademarks again. Why? Because the wallets, they can have a domain name and people are registering domain names for uh, unknown trademarks that they don't own. So this is the new trend. Also, there's a lot of people running to register trademarks but there's a, a, a big thing happening because you see that clothes can be worn on the internet, right? You can sell digital clothes. But there is a specific category to register a clothes, which not, does not include digital clothes. <laughs> so there's a lot of confusion. There's a, a very recent case, Hermes with Rothschild, who uh, he sold the Meta Birkins as art and the court said, no, that's not art because you are making money. 
using the Hermes brand. So there's a lot of confusion out there. And another important thing is about, as I said, artificial intelligence. Someone mentioned here early ch uh, chat uh, GPT. And uh, recent, the Copyright Office issued a policy because people are registering image generated through, as, through artificial intelligence as if they were copyrightable. And they're going back to those files and said, no, we need to review that. Because what you can register are the prompts that you use, the example in the chat GPT, that you use to create the image or to create the text, but you cannot own. So that's a lot of things that we saw in the web, 1.0, uh, 2.0, and they're gonna come back now because the artificial intelligence is copying everything that is out there in the world and creating something. And if you use someone's copyright, you, can, you are infringing that copyright. So there's a lot of ego issues out there. So just be careful and know what you are using and what you're doing. <laughs> Natalia and I gave a uh, presentation to the Federal Bar Association last summer on NFTs and copyright. And from that, Natalia was invited to be on uh, this task force that's looking at all of this at the federal level. So it's really very detailed and very, uh, very intense. But in the meantime, the creativity continues, and that's the exciting side of it. Um, and so let's talk a little bit about, you know, uh, Ian, you say, okay, Jalen Clark, as an example, is an economy. Let's dive into that a tiny bit. What do you mean by that? What is he doing in NFT? What is he doing in Web3? How's he, m and he created a token, right? So talk a little bit about his ecosystem. So the way that we built out his ecosystem was focusing on his off-court things. So athletes today aren't just bouncing a basketball and catching a football. Um, they're doing a lot more things outside of the game, and we really wanted to highlight that. Jalen has a huge YouTube following, and w we initially used the YouTube to bring people in. So... We used the, the, the token at first to allow people to purchase the token and then make suggestions on to his YouTube. Um, and if you bought the next tier, then you might be able to star in one of his YouTube videos. And then a tier after that, you might be able to get tickets to a UCLA game and sit with his family and, and have a jersey and have kind of the family experience. So we really wanted to build out everything outside of basketball for Jalen and allow people who are his fans and people who are really interested in working with Jalen to have access that way. And we were able to do that through his token. Um, we were also able to do that through an NFT basketball that he had that was um, augmented reality so you could put it in front of you. Um, and every person who purchased that received a signed basketball um, that um, – you were able to use and get into actually a UCLA game using the basketball. So well, there were there were some really interesting use cases that he was able to um, do with his token. So this is where we are now. Imagination, uh, you can take this to a million different places. It's really exciting. If you have a following, if an individual or a an IP, and you are an IP, own your own IP is the tagline for the ownership economy. Uh, if you own your own IP, you can create whatever you want in these new universes. I mean, obviously, we need help and guidance and information and education. That's why I wrote the book. By the way, I have books here today, so uh, people can g start learning. Or you can just go online. I spent a ton of time in Twitter spaces. Twitter spaces is a social audio. It's like Clubhouse. You, it's like Clubhouse. But on you, Twitter. Can, you can join <laughs> in and just listen in on conversations. That's how I met um, Ian. That's how uh, Shira is very big in Twitter spaces. There's, I spent a ton of time just learning. Um, I think uh, one of our panel members on the previous panel talked about he already does all these things, but he's learning all the time. My hashtag in the old Web2 days was hashtag always be learning, and I am. And so I am not the demographic you think is going to know about NFTs. I realize that. But, uh, but <laughs> so that's not true. Like <laughs> I, but what I must say is about this new revolution, Web3, it's not age-specific. I'm meeting so many different people. I would say, having been in Web2, 
it was age specific and I started to feel kind of old and it was getting a bit weird. Um, and so that's why I am inspired while there is a lot of weirdness right now and it's hazy and we're trying to figure it out. When I go to these IRL events and I see who's actually part of the community, I'm like, wow, uh, there's a lot of different types of people and we're trying to make it as inclusive and diverse as possible because we're at the beginning. And if we're at the beginning, if we're creating the rules, let's create new rules. Let's create a new table for everyone, right? And let's be very aware of what we want to do and how we're doing it. Right? And so that's what, for me, is very exciting because we're seeing what didn't work in previous iterations of this and we're saying, like, how can we do it in a new way and do it better? So, like, while you did call yourself out and you could joke around about age, which I do too, like, I just think we're in a, in a time where um, people are appreciating talent, care, enthusiasm, uh, and values more than ever before. And, and that doesn't discriminate against anything, even though we know there's a lot of people that still do discriminate. Yeah, just one thing, I wanna share my personal opinion because this is the center for media, entertainment, and sports. And I think the future, and the future is already here, everything is gonna be entertainment because we have a separation now between media, entertainment, and sports. And uh, well, while I was preparing for this presentation, I realized because my friend does business immigration also, and the immigration has a visa for entertainment that considers only television and audiovisual, like movies, theater, and they are including social media. They are including another types of entertainment into the concept of entertainment. So I think that's the future, and this is gonna the the social media, the web 3.0, everything is gonna be entertainment. So what we could talk for another 30, 40 yeah, you minutes. We have a four-hour radio show. So I yeah, know. This so is that's why Twitter <laughs> Spaces goes on forever. But we have a few minutes <laughs> left uh, to maybe take a couple of questions. We will be here. I'll be here most of the day. Hopefully other people will be as well on the panel. Happy to talk to everybody about uh, our, our ideas. But let's go with a – you have a question, sir? Yes. Uh, my question is we mentioned early IP and – being the business of you. But earlier we were talking about terms of service on the platform says once your content is uploaded, it's owned by Meta, Facebook, whoever. That's right. How do you get your content back? You, well, that you're not going to get your content back that's already out there. What you're going to do is create new content and put it on the blockchain and then you own it. And that's a whole new process. So this is a completely different way of looking at the world and how we create and how we distribute our own creation. But go ahead uh, if you want to yeah, talk say about the, that. Yeah, the, the issue and what people say is like we're creating Web3 uh, spaces and products but in a Web2 world right now. And that's the biggest issue, right? So when you post uh, an image or a video clip or anything and you own it on the blockchain and you post it to a platform like an OpenSea or Coinbase NFT or Magic Eden, you own that, right? They don't own it. Um, and you create a smart contract that says the percentage after primary sales, which mostly go to you besides processing fees, after that secondary sales, you have like, there's a usually max 10% royalty fee. Um, but that's because you are empowering someone else to own that. So actually it's like selling a piece of art. So your community is part of the ownership of it. So it's a different way of looking at ownership, right, and identity. But yeah, once you put something on a Facebook and Instagram and all that, yeah, it's basically. You tell. But I think you could speak to that because I, I like the lawyer, because when I, in news, while we could say, oh, we're covering it, it's a, a picture on social, we have gotten flagged. So we are very wary of that if we want to follow the rules. So I do believe once we put our stuff out there on these social platforms, you could say it's, in public domain, is there a case where you still have ownership and you could flag it? No, I think you have to read the terms and conditions, whatever you are yeah. doing to see if you like, for example, nowadays on Instagram, if your profile is public, they own, like they can use your image. You give a license to them. I, of I, using I, guess, all my, your I guess my question is, well, the part of that is, what would you tell folks going forward? Now that we know that, That's it's like, right. what, what do I do now going forward if my business is on the platform and now I need to pull that ownership back some way. Well, that's what what's th probably the next iteration, just like what happened in the dot-com era and in the early social media era. Here's this new technology. Here's all these new opportunities. 
the first thing everybody has to do is get educated and informed about what in the world is changing and happening and what does all this mean. And then we put business, uh, uh, business basics to, the, to, the, uh, to what it is that we want to do. What do we have to do to protect ourselves? What do we have to do to expand and create and, and build? It's a process. It's not going to be a, an instant answer. A lot of people think we're in Web 2.5 because, as Shira said, we're still in Web 2.0, which is they own the content. But hey, you're not on Instagram. You're not on TikTok. Well, what are you doing? So you have to be there. But yet, there's this new world emerging. So it's kind of two parallel tracks, in a way. Maybe you can answer that, Ian, because some people, like your athletes, are in both places. How do you help them through that? For sure. I, I, I think it really depends in action exactly what you're doing and what content you're putting out. Um, all content can't necessarily be monetized. Um, you're gonna, you're going to have to do some marketing, and just like Beverly was saying, we are currently in the Web 2.0 world, so it's extremely difficult to monetize that content. But if you have a component of your business that will allow you to live or to have some of that content live on the blockchain, then you'll be able to to work on both sides, and it could be twofold. You'll be able to move over. So we'll have a, we have time for maybe. Oh, we have no more time. Okay, well, so you copy, just we have copyright minutes, and trademark what you're doing, but you have to realize like the core content. I think we have time wise. for one more question because it says we have three minutes. No? Okay, we, oh, don't. we don't. There's three minutes. Thank you all. There it goes. Wow. Follow us and DM us. <laughs>